so good afternoon. Uh, let me start uh, the, the meeting. I guess we have a lot of things that we want to debate, so earlier we start, there is more chance that we will get to most of the topics. So first of all, uh, 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 as you know from invitation, I am Ludek Nidromer, member of uh, EPP from Czech Republic. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for, for coming and for interest in, in uh, such an event. Let me say that uh, unless uh, things get really bad, we will be able to provide the video from, from this uh, event. So that means that you can use it, download it, or pass it to the, to, uh, to the others. So let me say that, as you probably know, and this is why we are here, uh, the tax issues are considered, in my view, as one of the most important economic agenda of current parliament. The reasons are multiple. Uh, this is not just the fiscal issue that we need to collect tax better, but it's, it has also social issues because there is feeling among people that there is not enough justice in tax policy. And last not least, there is an issue of fair competition because if some firms don't pay taxes and the others do, the competition is badly distorted. We are debating this issue uh, in the European Parliament and European Union because we are fully aware that uh, it's not just a national issue. There is only something that can be done on the level of the states. But we recognize quite clearly that a lot of issues are really can be tackled only on the level of the, of the EU. But that's not enough. Uh, we, we are fully aware that most of the pressing issues, or many of the pressing issues, are going above the scope of EU, are, are of global nation. That's why we are, we are very uh, closely cooperating with OECD, with the experts from World Bank and different forums where we can get to the highest, level, uh, highest possible level of debate on the tax issue all around the world. So that's why we must uh, look at the things that are going outside of, uh, of, of the EU and uh, to try to understand what the most important uh, uh, things, the reforms, the changes outside of EU, what will be the impact on the tax policy all around the world. That's why we agreed with Jeff that, uh, that it's really important to have a debate on the U.S. tax reform. U.S. is one of the superpowers. It's very strong economy and its tax policy had impact on the, on the global tax environment and will have impact on the global tax environment. So I know that there are even more issues that can be debated on transatlantic relationship, on trade and so on, but I guess it's a really good time to debate the, the tax issue and I am very grateful that we find together with, uh, with uh, my, my colleague uh, the time and energy to set up the events. So let me pass floor to him now. <clears throat> Thank you, Ludek. And, uh, also, great to see uh, this attendance uh, today on this very important topic. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, dist distinguished uh, guests, colleagues, um, I think it's, it's, it's very uh, likely and very good that we have this discussion on the global effect of the U.S. tax reform right now. Um, and of course, uh, a special attention on uh, this dramatic reform might have of consequences of, for Europe. Um, it's clear, that, at least to most people, that our economies are becoming more and more interconnected. We live in an interconnected world, value chains, economies, and so on. I hope it's also clear for the White House sometimes, but this, that's another issue. Um, company structures, and especially company tax structures, have long ago outgrown uh, the confines of our traditional 19th century tax systems. Competition between countries on tax rates and regulation is growing fiercer. Uh, and even more, we might disagree uh, on the political points on how you know, high corporate tax rates should be or what specific or taxes or deductions should be in effect. I think that we can all agree that if we are to have any control over especially corporate tax and taxation of high net worth individuals, um, we need to adopt a more global perspective than we have seen so far in this case. Um, we need, as politicians and lawmakers, to develop a sharper eye for how national, uh, European, and U.S. tax policies interact uh, on the international level. And that is in part of what I hope to achieve here today, a better understanding of the international dimension of this domestic policy change in the U.S. and a wider horizon uh, on possibilities, challenges, and solutions to growing both our economies, our trade, and indeed our tax bases on both sides of the Atlantic in a, in a fair manner. And I'll say no more. We have limited time, and I'm eager to hear 
uh, both from the invited experts on the panel, but also, of course, uh, a little later from the audience here. So again, thank you for coming. Look forward to an interesting uh, discussion. Thank you, Ayepe. Uh, the plan is that now we will go through the presentation or speeches of our guests. Uh, it will be followed by discussion, if time permits. Uh, we should finish at quarter past two with the tolerance of, uh, let's say, uh, let's say ten minutes. When we start to plan the, the event, uh, and it was not uh, just work of AP and myself, but uh, uh, without help of our staff, notably Petra, we would not be able to make it. We were looking after some experts from the United States because there is uh, not any other place that can represent the better the, the description uh, of, the, uh, of the U.S. tax reform. And we were very lucky to end up with Professor Stephen Shai, who is here who is uh, the, the senior lecturer on law on Harvard since 2015. Before that, he was working as a deputy assistant secretary for international tax affairs of the United States uh, at Treasury, uh, being involved, for example, in FATCA. But before that, more importantly, he was uh, working for more than 20 years with the le uh, legal firm Rope and Gray, where he worked uh, on the tax issue. Tax issue. He's publishing uh, many, uh, many uh, researches and books on the tax issues, and uh, also cooperating with the, uh, with, the, the, uh, with the Congress. So I am very pleased that we are having you, and uh, let's start with your insight about uh, what's going on and what are the implications both for U.S. and for the global economy. And welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm not sure I should thank you for the task of trying to explain U.S. tax reform in 10 minutes or less. Um, but let me try, and that will be, I hope, a base from which we can have a conversation. Um, so if we can, uh, let me give you a little bit of context. I'm going to try and work from four slides, 10 minutes, four slides. That should be possible. You can have 15. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, and give you a framework with which to think about the U.S. tax reform. So this slide, uh, which I hope you can read from a distance, um, is the first place to begin. Uh, now, these are OECD data numbers, and what the OECD does, which I think is appropriate, is to look at the statutory rates of tax in countries combining both the federal and the provincial taxes, so federal and local, when for those countries that have a, a subnational tax, as the United States does, as many European countries do. Um, and what it shows, I took a, a handful of countries in the top part of the slide, Canada, Germany, Japan, just to show the direction of their tax rates between 2000 and 2018. And they had lowered their taxes before the United States changed its tax. Um, but that shows you the 2000 rate, according to OECD data, and, and that's a combined rate, which is why it doesn't come out as an even number. Um, and the same um, for 2018. The U.S. rate reflected there on the left, the 39.34, is where the U.S. had been for a very, very long time. Um, and so last year, uh, the corporate tax rate was, the federal corporate tax rate was reduced dramatically from 35 percent to 21 percent. And that is by far the most important single element of the tax reform, at least as it affects business. So my, my discussion today in these 15 minutes will really be focused on business taxation, not taxation of high net worth individuals as such, which tends to, to differ. In the bottom part of the slide, I picked countries that are um, frankly well known for tax planning. I hope I offend nobody in the room. Um, uh, and look at the rates in those countries in order to then go over to the far right-hand column. In the far right-hand column it is a fraction that is the foreign taxes that are paid by all U.S. controlled foreign corporations, all foreign subsidiaries of U.S. molding nationals over their earnings compared to their pre-tax earnings. 
That's data which you can get from the IRS. This is from the statistics of income. And this is before tax reform, before tax reform. It's unaffected by U.S. taxes because it's the taxes paid only by the foreign subsidiaries of U.S. multinational groups. And if you look there, you'll see some interesting numbers that show that U.S. multinationals have been quite successful at keeping their foreign taxes low. And that basically is unchanged by, by that, that data. That's the most recent data we have is 2014 because it takes years to get that out to the public in a form that can be looked at. But that data um, is not going to change dramatically. The numbers will probably go down somewhat. When we look at what I think of as the tax planning countries, and for all this data, you have to be very careful because this data does not differentiate between the country where the company is organized and where it earns its income because we have rules that permit a subsidiary to be disregarded. So the tax numbers in the right-hand column include taxes not just from the country over on the left, but Irish affiliates tend not to have many non-Irish subsidiaries for planning reasons that we don't have time to get into. So that number of 3.1 percent is pretty reflective of what U.S. companies are able to pay with respect to their operations in Ireland. And what's striking about that is that is not Apple. That is all Irish organized subsidiaries of U.S. multinationals in 2014. That is an aggregate number. And we look in the data for Apple from the hearings and so forth, and that's even lower. But Apple is not alone, just to be clear about that. Okay, so that's one context. And that's the single most important thing to know about the U.S. business tax reform is the reduction in rate, A. And you should know by background that the U.S. companies generally have been very effective at keeping their foreign taxes low through planning. Now let's go to the next slide, if I can. Okay. This is a slide um, which was published uh, two days ago by the Congressional uh, uh, Budget Office, um, known as CBO. And what it shows is um, the sources of spending on the left, and only the larger column has the titles, but they're the same on, on the on the, in the left column on the far left as well as the one for 2048. But basically what it shows is if you project out the current U.S. expenditures and the current U.S. Um, revenues after tax reform, we have large deficits that will grow much larger. So the question that that raises is how sustainable that picture is um, and how is the U.S. going to address its growing deficit problem, which is very much a function of its aging population. Um, our baby boomer, our largest uh, cohort of, of, of uh, people now are becoming, moving into the 60s, uh, moving into the age uh, of, of 60 and older, and they cost more money because of our Social Security and so forth. Um, so that's the context in which the overall picture is occurring, and it raises a question as to the sustainability of the reduced tax rates. So if we go to the next slide, this is my one slide to try and explain the international reforms, and they are complicated. They depend on where you put your investment and who you are selling to. That's, that's the first set of equations. So in this slide, the black line running down the middle separates the United States from the rest of the world. The left-hand side is the United States. The right-hand side is the rest of the world. And you may be aware that in the United States, we think of all other countries as ROW, rest of world. Um, uh, um, if you – and so the exercise I was asking myself in this slide – was what happens if I put a new plant, a new investment in the United States after tax reform, 
And what happens if I put it on the right-hand side outside the United States on tax reform? So let me walk you through what the various rules do. First of all, on the left-hand side, if I sell to U.S. customers, my tax rate is 21%. But also importantly, at least through 2025, through 2025, the year 2025, any investment I make, um, which can include buying something, it doesn't have to be a brand new investment, I will be able to take in business equipment, in business assets other than real estate, I will be able to get a 100% deduction for that investment. So if you think of selling to U.S. customers, new investment, 100% deduction for the investment, 21% tax rate once I start paying tax after I've recovered that investment. Okay? Um, that's pretty powerful. But in addition, if I sell to foreign customers, then I earn something that is uh, called or potentially earn a kind of an export income, which is known as FDII or FIGI, and you can now forget it if you're not a tax lawyer. Just think of it as I earn export income, and to the extent that that export income exceeds a 10% return on my investment, on the tax value of my investment, then to the extent it exceeds that, then I get another deduction that reduces my effective rate from 21% to 13 and an eighth percent, or 13.125%. So try and hold that in your head for a moment. Now, those of you who are really quick are saying to yourself, but wait a second, I thought Mr. Shea just said that you get a 100% deduction for your new investment, so you have no basis. So this applies to everything from dollar one. That would be too easy. We actually use a different tax basis for purposes of determining that 10% return that is straight line over the life of the property. But taken together, expensing plus reduced rate, this is a very, very generous incentive. This last incentive is only for exports. And you will immediately start saying, wait a second, how is that possible? Don't they have, aren't they in the WTO? Don't they have some obligations in that regard? The answer is yes, we are. And uh, the, we do not yet have a clear answer as to whether or not this is consistent with WTO obligations. Most people so far think it is not, most academics, I should say. There is one academic who I thought made a heroic argument for why it would be compatible with the WTO, but um, I'm not buying it um, so far. I'm, I'm unpersuaded that this can be found consistent with the WTO. Now, that is a second sustainability issue, because if... Part of what we're going to do when I turn it over to my colleague, uh, Mr. Visser from uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, is uh, we're going to say, well, what would the investor do? How is this going to affect investment? Because ultimately, that's what we want to understand in terms of what's the effect of this tax policy. So, so far, I've identified two low-level sustainability issues, the sustainability of the rate, which is very important when you expense an asset, and the sustainability of the export incentive. Um, Right-hand side, what happens if I put my plant outside the United States and I'm able to just for the moment assume, realize a very low effective tax rate? And from the data I've already showed you, that is not a heroic assumption. Um, and what I like to think of in my mind as a model is Let's say that I have a choice of a plant in El Paso, Texas, or 10 miles away in Mexico, less than 10 miles across the river. So these are very real factors. And let's assume I can get a maquilladora or some kind of relief on the Mexican side. So what happens for U.S. taxes? First of all, 
the same 10% return on that tangible investment will not be taxed by the United States. So if I only earn up to 10% return on my tangible investment using the same tax basis I talked about before, if I dividended those earnings, then to that extent, I would have no additional U.S. tax to whatever I'm paying in Mexico, whatever I can negotiate in another country. The excess of that is going to be what's called guilty, G-I-L-T-I, where the name is purely political in manufacturing. Um, It refers to intangible income. It has nothing to do with intangible income. It has to do with all the income of my foreign subsidiary in excess of that 10% return to tangible investment. That income will be taxed by the United States after a 50% deduction. I get a 50% deduction against my so-called guilty, which doesn't sound too guilty to me. It sounds pretty good. But that means my effective rate is 10.5%. So that's your base comparison. Assume I can earn very low effective foreign taxes. Assume I can keep my foreign taxes very low. If you only look at the U.S. side, if I put the plant outside the United States, exemption for 10% return on tangible, 10.5% over and above that. If I put it inside the United States, 21% but with expensing, and if I sell to foreign customers, if I'm exporting, I get expensing and 13.125%. That's the simplest I can make our international tax reform. Um, the trouble on the 3.125% is, is sustainability, but uh, frankly, taxpayers are not hurt by a WTO case. Unlike state aid, there's not recovery from the individual taxpayer. There's recovery from the country in the form of retaliatory tariffs. So in terms of how it affects my investment, I'm not sure it has much of an effect. So I'm going to go to my last slide. Um, If I just do this comparison, then um, it all depends on how high the foreign taxes are. If I can find a way to hold the investment where the foreign taxes are low enough, then the foreign investment after guilty, the tangible investment, is quite valuable. Um, if, if I can't do that, then it becomes much more complicated. And what makes it very complicated is when we go back to the foreign side of the investment. So let me go back one slide, Petra, if I can. If I go back to that right-hand side, now let's assume I'm paying more foreign taxes The question is, how can I credit those taxes against that 10.5%? And it's quite, um, they're quite limited. Uh, the, the, the credit limitation is quite strong. So I, in order for this to be favorable to investing outside the United States, it has to be quite low taxes. I have to be very effective in my international tax planning. Otherwise, um, I'm going to be paying the same as I would in the U.S. Now, having said all this, if you ask me, and I want to turn it over to whoever our next speaker is, where I think things are, um, I think there is a lot of uncertainty about many technical aspects of these rules. Um, uh, There is a rule that I haven't really talked much about called the base erosion uh, alternative tax, or BEAT, that in this slide I've assumed I can avoid, and you can assume that in a wide range of cases it can be avoided or or reduced in terms of impact, although businesses are very concerned about it, and what I just said doesn't apply to finance businesses. Um, And I've left out a lot of other details. Those details, combined with the uncertainty of where rates may go, how stable the rates are, and we'll know more after the elections in the United States, the so-called midterm elections at the end of this year, combined with not knowing how your countries are going to respond to BEPS and where things are going to end up with respect to BEPS responses, this is as difficult an international environment to do business tax planning as any I've seen since I've been practicing, which started in the late 1970s. So with that, I'll 
thank you and leave it to the next person. Thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, uh, highly interesting and the end, uh, that means saying that it's extremely complicated, uh, really helps, I must say. But uh, let's believe that other speakers will give us a little bit more clear message. Uh, we are, and we will get back to the issues of sustainability and so in, in debate, I'm quite sure, because this is a fascinating subject, not only from the text point of view, but from the point of view of general economy. We are very fortunate to have here uh, Lothar Ehring from the Commission. We want to have a speaker from the Commission, and we are very happy that you accept our invitation, because Lothar is senior expert at Commission and DG Trade, where he works on legal unit uh, on uh, quite an interesting subject. And uh, if I list the, the, the subjects that are under his responsibility, like w, uh, WT uh, legal question, UK withdrawal, or US trade policy, then you shouldn't be surprised that Lothar will have to leave a little bit early in quarter to two. But still we have you here, and uh, the, the trade uh, issues related to tax reform are of extremely high interest for us. So welcome. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction and also for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here and uh, speak to you briefly. Um, as uh, I was correctly introduced, I am a specialist of international trade uh, law, and that is what I will cover in my little presentation. Um, as you may know, we have in the European Commission also a Directorate General responsible for taxation and the customs union, and fortunately, one of their experts is uh, here uh, today um, and uh, much more versed than I am on real matters of uh, taxation. Uh, we trade uh, experts, we only look at the impact that these rules have on international uh, trade. And it's very useful that Stephen already explained to you the framework and working of the new U.S. tax legislation. So I can assume that you all understand this uh, now, and I will uh, build on, on that. But before doing that, I want to take a step back and uh, refer to something that is not of immediate relevance technically now, but is a very important uh, background also to how we have uh, gotten here in the U.S. Uh, tax reform. More or less every 20 years, um, in the United States, there is a big debate and a complaint about the uh, alleged unfairness of the international uh, tax systems, uh, mainly because of the fact that in the United States there is not a federal level consumption tax, what in many other countries and nearly all other countries exists and is called a value-added tax or a sales tax or a goods and services tax. Um, and, and that um, uh, results also in imports into the United States not being uh, subject to such a uh, value-added uh, tax. Uh, and exports from the United States also don't get reimbursed that value-added uh, tax because uh, it does not exist. In contrast, other countries that uh, export to the United States reimburse the value added tax on their exports to the United States. And that is often perceived as unfair over there. Um, and uh, when U.S. exports reach those markets, they face value added uh, tax. Um, and last year, uh, until more or less a year ago, there was a very intensive uh, debate and effort in the United States to redress uh, all this imbalance through the introduction of a completely new and different tax to replace the corporate income tax uh, under the name of uh, direct uh, destination-based uh, cash flow uh, tax. And that tax would have dramatically modified uh, trade flows uh, because it uh, would have encouraged uh, U.S. exports compared to the current situation by exempting U.S. exports entirely from that uh, taxation and by penalizing compared to today uh, imports, making them subject to this destination-based cash flow uh, tax. It was very controversial in the United States, um, uh, notably amongst 
all who uh, companies and consumers who buy imports because they would have had to pay uh, more. Um, and we also uh, tried to intervene in that debate by pointing out that our impression is that these modifications, which penalize imports and encourage exports, are incompatible with the WTO prohibitions on the discrimination of imports and on the subsidization of exports. So it did not happen. And what happened instead is that we got the tax reform at the end of uh, last year, which was essentially a tax rate cut without modifying the uh, general nature of the tax, which remained a corporate income tax levied on the profits of corporations, um, which is, uh, is, of course, much more complicated in reality. I know that, but for uh, simple minds, uh, which is the difference between the earnings and the uh, expenses of a corporation. Um, and tax, tax rate cuts, you know, the level of taxation, um, not only in international taxation with uh, the qualification, of course, of modern um, efforts of uh, disciplining excessive competition through uh, uh, excessively low or totally absent uh, income taxation, that is normally a matter for domestic um, sovereign decisions and in international trade that is also something which every WTO member can decide uh, for itself. So the tax cut in itself in, in the manner it happened in the United States is not a problem. And that is why in the international trade perspective and critique of the new US tax legislation, we have to limit ourselves to uh, fine details and individual aspects that are part of this package and that appear problematic, uh, but it's not unlike the reform idea that was strongly pushed a year ago. It is not the reform itself and the main uh, core of that reform which is a problem. Um, and that's also the reason why the debate transatlantically has gone a little bit quiet when the final package of the tax reform came about. Uh, I just mentioned in passing that the process of that reform was also much less uh, easy to follow from the outside than was the reform ideas earlier because the final package came out really last day uh, without having been seen beforehand as a proposal uh, that one could already uh, study and uh, understand. Um, the two uh, problematic aspects of the new tax uh, system have already been uh, mentioned and in part explained by, by Stephen. Um, mainly the one I will mention second, uh, but first I will mention the one which was uh, briefly um, referred to as the, the beat B. EAT, or um, because you should not learn such acronyms, the Base Erosion and Anti-Abuse Tax. Um, the name already says what the purpose is behind, um, and it is a, a tax of um, mostly 10% that applies to payments by a U.S. taxpayer to a foreign person that is a related party and with respect to which a deduction is allowable. Um, to put this in plainer words, these are business expenses uh, in the form of subsidiaries, mother companies or sister companies, so that's related party, inside a conglomerate. Um, if you have you know, BMW United States and BMW uh, in Germany and payments flow between them, uh, for the purchase uh, inter alia of services and uh, goods. Um, the cost of goods sold are excluded uh, from, from this, and that again reduces the area in which this anti-abuse uh, tax 
applies. But it remains that there are purchases of goods and services which U.S. companies make abroad with related parties. Yeah? So if these are completely different companies that have nothing to do with another, this anti-abuse tax does not exist. But it exists if these are affiliated parties. Um, and that is, of course, also where we know there is a potential and a risk for base erosion, transfer pricing, um, yeah, abusive schemes where uh, excessive payments are made for products or services that are not worth that much, uh, but the purpose is only to reduce the profits in the United States and increase them somewhere else where the taxation of the profits will be uh, lower. Um, so we have situations inside such uh, conglomerates that in addition must reach a certain size, overall uh, average annual gross receipts of 500 million US dollars. But as you know, there are many large corporations that reach this level. Um, and there you would have a penalization of importation and um, of goods and services, as well as intellectual property. So if um, patents are held by the affiliates abroad and then used uh, in the United States and payments flow for that, uh, the anti-abuse base erosion tax uh, can also kick in. Um, and all of that is, uh, whenever it applies, is discriminatory because these are taxes levied on purchases uh, from abroad and not levied when the same purchases of exactly the same goods, services, or license payments for intellectual property is made within the United States. And that is something which we can challenge under WTO non-discrimination rules uh, that apply to services and uh, trade in goods. Uh, can there be a justification for this under the label of anti-abuse uh, measures? Uh, we don't think so, because the uh, tax covers also completely normal and legitimate uh, business operations. The uh, abu anti-abuse is in the label, in the title, but not in the criteria and the conditions under which the tax uh, applies. Um, and to give you an, an example, the um, banking sector you know, has detected that uh, this would apply to uh, reinsurances that are made, that are insurance services that are purchased from, uh, from abroad or interest payments on, on loans. Um, and this can be completely commercially sound, uh, non-abusive non uh, structures that uh, would probably now change because the companies in the United States will try to avoid this additional uh, tax. Um, the other WTO breach that we uh, detect is this uh, foreign-derived intangible income, which Stephen uh, explained, um, which uh, generates a, a deduction and therefore a tax saving that is applicable in certain circumstances, to exports. Um, and so you have uh, many U.S. companies that are in a situation where they can save more money if they export uh, more goods uh, and services. But in the WTO, we have a prohibition on uh, export subsidization of goods. We don't have that prohibition for uh, services, so we look only at the effect on trade in goods, um, and uh, no justification is even available in this area. As a result, uh, we uh, have detected, and, and others have too, uh, in the United States, it's true, mostly academically, and it's also true that the debate and outrage uh, has not reached the same level of publicity uh, as it had during the debate for the introduction of this uh, cash flow uh, tax. Uh, in my view, this is explained in large part, uh, one, by the much higher level of sophistication and technicality that uh, you need to understand to even 
detect these uh, problems. Uh, secondly, also that we are dealing with uh, individual aspects and not the big scheme uh, as a whole. And, and thirdly, that at the same time, uh, as you will know from at least the news, um, other issues of uh, more immediate uh, and obvious, uh, far less technical nature have arisen in the relations between the United States and the rest of the world uh, that we are spending a lot of attention uh, on uh, these days. And that is why this uh, tax reform has dropped a little bit in the attention it receives. But we continue to study it. We notably uh, inquire with uh, uh, the economy, the uh, EU businesses, notably those that are active in the United States, uh, what the impact of this is on them, what the losses uh, are for them, um, so that we can evaluate how big is, is the damage, how uh, much are EU trade interests affected and harmed uh, by this, and uh, then uh, whether uh, we should again, as we have already twice in the last decades, bring a WTO dispute against the United States over its uh, WTO incompatible taxation systems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lothar, for a for, uh, clear message and also for taking care of even smaller issues, uh, not just big ones. And uh, given your agenda, as I said, I fully understand that you will have to leave uh, earlier. Anyway, thanks for coming. Last but not least, we have uh, Edwin Wieser. I'm very glad to have him because Edwin has an excellent background of not only being now tax partners with uh, uh, PwC, responsible mostly for, for taxing issues, strategic advice, tax con uh, the controversy, and so on. But before that, he was for a very long time uh, serving at the Dutch Ministry of Finance as a Deputy General Director for Tax and Custom Policy, Director for Direct Taxes. Before that, he was very active in the field of academy, also co-author of tax uh, encyclopedia in, uh, in uh, Dutch, and among other things, he was involved uh, on behalf of Netherlands in, in uh, participating with OECD work in the area of BEPS. And uh, Edwin, you have got a very, uh, very simple question from, uh, from uh, Stephen. And that means uh, the question is, uh, what would you advise the clients, given the uncertainty in the uh, environment? Because this is something that for sure people are asking. But obviously, you should, you should uh, talk about more broad issues. And welcome here. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Luther, for the kind introduction and for inviting me here. Yeah, you put the bar very high. What would you advise clients? That's, that's a difficult question. And at this moment in time, very difficult to answer. I'll go to my presentation, and I hope you'll agree at the end of my presentation that indeed at this point in time it's very difficult to answer that, that question. I will address some of the measures more qualitatively. It is very hard to understand the effects of all the measures uh, in combination with each other. Uh, we need really economic models to do so. We cannot do it by intuition. Uh, that's, I think, what Steve is also uh, saying. But let's start with the first thing, this is an overview on the screen of the measures I will run through, and you will have to get to use. They're also in the handout that's on the table there, by the way. Um, new acronyms like GUILTY, Global Income, Low Tax, Intangible, nothing to do with intangible, of course, as Steve said, FIDI, Foreign Derived Intangible Income, BEAT, but also, you know, the most important ones, that's the lowering of the, inc of the corporate tax rate of the U.S. and the introduction of a territorial uh, system. Um, before going into more detail uh, into the impact of those measures on potential impact on investment decisions and the question whether the U.S. has implemented the recommendations of the OECD uh, from the Beige Erosion and Profit Shifting Project, first a very brief overview of winners and losers of U.S. tax reform. That's the next picture, Petra. It's a very interesting pie chart, I think. This is an overview who benefits and how much or the winners and losers of U.S. tax reform. And it's good to remind, I think, that most of those measures only have a window of about 10 years. 
that's the window of the most of the measures, except for the lowering of the corporate income tax rate, for example. That's one of the measures that will that will continue after 10 years. That's a budget window for, for those measures. Um, we now turn to the first block of my presentation. That's the impact on investment. I already made a caveat. It's, it's very hard or impossible to predict the effects of U.S. tax reform on location decision and investment decisions by intuition. So I'll address the potential effects and impact based on a sort of qualitative analysis and be mindful that, you know, for the real impact you have to take all the measures into account in combination of each other. The Secretary General of the OCD stated after the presentation of the OCD's 2018 Economic Survey of the U.S. that the OCD expects that U.S. tax reform will lead to higher investments and strong economic growth, at least in the short term. And that's true, I think, for the first quarter of 2018, that's in the next picture, Petra, you will see that increase in investment, non-residential fixed investment is indeed 9.2 percent. I don't have figures yet for quarter two and, and onwards. Uh, when you look at the impact of the deficit of the U.S., and that's the next picture, those are figures presented and computed by the Congressional Budget Office, you see that the average deficit of the last 40 years is around 2.9 percent GDP, gross domestic product. When you look at the current deficit, it's around 4 percent, and the predicted deficits, and those are impacted by U.S. tax reform, and 2028 is the end of the budget window for U.S. tax reform, you will see that the baseline is around 5.1 percent deficit of GDP, and the alternative one is 7.1. So somewhere between 5 and 7 percent deficit in 2018 is predicted by the Congressional Budget Office. That's huge numbers, I think, just to provide you a bit of context. Um, the measure with the most impact, and Steve already said it, is the uh, lowering of the corporate income tax rate of the U.S. from 35 percent federal to 21 percent federal. That's the next. Ah, I already have it, uh, Petra. You can see it over there. It was 38.9 percent combined until the end of 2017, the U.S. tax rate, and the OCD average excluding the U.S. was 23.9, a huge gap, and the U.S. is really closing that gap by lowering the statutory tax rate to 21 percent, ending up at a combined rate of 25.8, a very competitive tax rate. In the next graph, you will see a breakdown per country, and you see that the U.S. is really well placed. Moving up from one of the countries at the bottom, to the, at the bottom, I must say, uh, with the highest combined uh, statutory rate to a very competitive position somewhere in the middle of the OECD countries. So that, that will really impact uh, investment decisions. Um, but to better understand the impact of investment decisions, one should not only look at the statutory rates, but also to the effective average and marginal uh, tax rates. The effective marginal tax rate is the corporate tax burden on a break-even investment, and the picture also in your, your handout. And it's important to understand that the effective marginal tax rate, so the tax rate on an additional dollar of break-even investment, uh, influences location decisions. Not determining, but it influences. There are many factors uh, influencing location decisions, and tax is one of them, and certainly the effective marginal uh, tax rate. So when you look at that, and you'll see that the 2017 marginal tax rate of the U.S. with no expensing was one of the highest in the world. That's on the bottom of the graph. When you look at U.S. 2027 law, when that's after the budget window, because then there will be no possibility for direct expensing anymore, the U.S. has moved up to an average marginal tax rate of 13.2 percent. So even without direct expensing, uh, it's a very competitive average marginal tax rate. 
When you look at the 2018 law with the direct expensing, as Steve explained, then the U.S. is having a effective marginal tax rate of 9%, and that's really, really competitive. Also important for location decisions, and more notably the scale of the, uh, the investment is the average, uh, the effective average uh, tax rate, and that's, that's in the next, uh, next graph. And you will see that U.S. after U.S. tax reform is in a very competitive position compared to OECD countries. So that's the high-level message I think I want to give you uh, when talking about the tax rate, the marginal tax rates, and the average uh, tax rates. Really impactful measure of the U.S. in terms of location decisions and scaling investments. And, and you see that the U.S. really follows trends in OECD countries. That's the next uh, table. Most countries have lowered their corporate income tax rate or are in the process of lowering the corporate income tax rates in the next years. You will see that, that even France is, is going to lower its corporate income tax rate. Four countries are increasing their corporate income tax rate, Latvia, Portugal, Turkey, and Korea. They are the exception to the rule. And the question is, you know, what, what does it mean? And that's the next graph that's interesting. There's a, a tool on the OECD website that gives you insight in the revenues of various uh, taxes, personal income tax, wage tax, corporate income tax. And you can make selections. You can play with the data. You can select years. You can select countries. What I did is I selected the G7 countries and Ireland and the Netherlands because they're quite well known in, in terms of tax planning. Uh, and what you see is that, for example, France, a country with a very hard stance on tax planning and tax avoidance, with a very high corporate income tax rate, has a revenue of around 2.04% of GDP in 2016, quite stable when you look at the past. When you look at the Netherlands, it's 3.31% of GDP. Not drawing any conclusions, but it's interesting. I think it's also interesting for the European Parliament to think about those macroeconomic figures and, and what does it mean if countries lower the tax rate? How can you explain that while lowering the tax rate, the revenue related, related to GDP is, is quite stable? And you see that for all the countries. It's not very volatile. It can be explained because of the lever effect. It can be also explained by the combination. When countries lower their rate, they often broaden the tax base. That's all happening uh, all the time, I think. So. Just as a takeaway, I put those figures in, in the slides. So, in addition to the lowering of the corporate income tax rate, the introduction of a territorial system is quite important, I think, for the U.S. There are worldwide tax systems and there are territorial tax systems. In the past, until 2017, the U.S. had a worldwide tax system. That means that all the profits of the subsidiaries are eventually taxed at the rate of the U.S. So, for example, when a foreign subsidiary pays a dividend, paid a dividend to the U.S. parent in 2017, that dividend would be taxed at 35 percent, and the foreign tax underlying that profit of the subsidiary would be set off, set off against U.S. tax. So that's a worldwide tax system. In the territorial tax system, you tax the profits of the subsidiaries at the level of the country where the subsidiary is resident of, and that's called capital import neutrality. So this allows U.S. companies to serve foreign markets on the same tax terms as non-U.S. companies in those markets. Um, and I think this measure, together with lowering the corporate income tax rate, really has taken away the trigger uh, for the type of tax planning Steve referred to Apple, the type of tax planning that we have seen for decades. The name of the game was to make sure that you could uh, defer the U.S. taxation on the profits of the foreign subsidiaries. That was what U.S. companies were doing. There's no need for that anymore after U.S. tax reform. So a real game changer, I would say, in the terms of international tax planning. Now we go to guilty. That's the fun part, the global income, low tax intangibles. And it's a base protection rule, in fact. It's a very expensive base protection rule. 
and Steve had a nice slide with a company having a U.S. plant in El Paso and uh, comparing that with an investment in Mexico, 10 miles over the Mexican border. And the question is, you know, is this a measure that leads to more investments in the U.S. because of its, it's a base erosion, it's an anti-base erosion measure, or is it a measure that still can stimulate investing abroad that would be a perverse effect because I think, and you can answer that better than I do, Steve, the measure was thought of as a measure to enhance and improve in investments in the U.S., but it can have the perverse effect, I think, that is still advantageous to allocate high-margin activities in low-tax jurisdiction because of the simple fact, you know, that 10.5%, because that's the effective statutory rate those income will be taxed upon is less than 21%. The equation is as simple as, as that. There's more behind that, of course, and there are quite complicated computations to get at that result. But I think that's one of the effects of guilty. If you have an effective tax rate overall aggregated for all the CFCs underlying underneath the U.S., that is uh, a bit more than 13.125%, there will be no incremental U.S. tax on the guilty income. So the guilty income, so the income, the aggregate income of the foreign subsidiaries on an aggregate level of the U.S. parent will be taxed at 10.5%. That's, that's the simple equation I make. And when we turn to FIDI, the foreign-derived intangible income, well, that, that's quite attractive, I think. It could have the potential that companies will invest more in research and development in the U.S. because income uh, will be taxed at 13.125%. Um, but on the other hand, there are quite a lot of uncertainties around FIDI. Uh, Mr. Earing mentioned them also, you know, is FIDI compatible with WTO rules? The European Union, for example, has asked the OECD to review whether the FIDI regime complies with OECD standards or whether it could be considered as a harmful tax practice. And in addition, if you make use of a patent box, for example, at this point in time, as a U.S. company, for example, in the Netherlands, U.K., or wherever, and it's, it's a regime with a low effective rate, and you don't fall under guilty as a U.S. parent, then it's still advantageous, I think, to use the patent box instead of moving your research and development to, to the U.S. So there are pros and cons, you know, around FIDI in terms of the impact of the investment. Um, Mr. Ehring already explained BEAT, the base erosion and anti-abuse uh, tax. And in theory, BEAT could lead to onshoring activities in the U.S. But it could also lead, I think, to offshoring the U.S. operation that makes the payment to the foreign subsidiary. If you do that, well, there's no BEAT uh, uh, tariff anymore. You see it happening, you know, with Harley-Davidson. It was in the newspapers, I think, the last days. Uh, because of the tariffs introduced by the European Union, Harley-Davidson is considering to move uh, the production of uh, motorcycles with the destination in the EU outside of the U.S. And now Mr. Trump in the FT this morning, Financial Times this morning, said, well, that if Harley-Davidson makes that move, it will be taxed like it would have never been before. So my conclusion is that our stair discussion will lead to nothing. Um, but could it help the U.S. this beat? Well, it could help the U.S. maybe in international negotiations with other countries to counter aggressive actions by those countries. Uh, and to refer to the digital service tax, for example, because that's perceived as being very aggressive by the U.S. Some people in the U.S. even compare it with a tariff, a tariff on U.S. tech companies. You know, and it's always important, I think, to, to look at those measures from different perspectives. We are quite concerned uh, by BEAT because it could violate the arm's length principle, one of the leading principles underlying international taxation. Yes, said, well, well, if you do, why are you upset? We're doing the same as you do with the digital companies. You introduce a DSD. So, well, that, that's the discussion we're having right now on a sort of policy level with the U.S. Uh, colleagues. Uh, last measure to address is the deemed mandatory repatriation and the toll charge. So all the cash stashes sitting abroad, and that's a uh, uh, dazzling amount of, I think, uh, 2,000 billion 
US dollars that companies have abroad in cash and investments. These cash stashes are taxed by a toll charge. It's, this cash is to be deemed repatriated to the US and taxed at a rate of 15.5% for cash or cash equivalent uh, repatriations and 8% for illiquid uh, assets. And with this, I think, in combination with the low rate and the participation exams in the territorial system, the trigger of underlying the tax planning of the last decades has really been removed. And the question is whether this toll charge and the deep repatriation will lead to additional investments in the U.S. There was a report by J.P. Morgan that was published in the Financial Times two days ago, and they computed that around 2% of the cash really repatriated, and that's around 217 billion U.S. dollars at this moment, around 2% is spent on capital expenditures. 98% is given back to shareholders at this moment. So will this deemed repatriation lead to more investments in the future? We'll have to see. I don't know the answer. Interesting figures, though. Turning now to the base erosion and profit shifting uh, project. Uh, I hope you all know about it. The report in 2013 starting the base erosion and profit shifting project at the OECD, leading to 15 recommendations, 15 reports in October 2015. The European Union has implemented the minimum standards and some measures beyond that in the Anti-Tax Avoidance Directive number one and, and number two, and in more transparency by changing rulings, for example, between member states and also in the mandatory disclosure requirements directive. When you look at the high level at US tax reform, I, can think, I think you can say that the US has implemented the minimum standards of BEPS with the hybrid mismatch rules that Action 2, the CFC, that's guilty, Action 3, earning stripping, Action 4, and so on and so on. So I think when you look at the measures, I th well, I conclude that the US is really implementing the BEPS recommendations. Not all of them, uh, but many of them. I'll stop here, Rebecca. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And before passing floor to, to Jeppe, uh, Jeppe, I would like to just uh, ask a very brief uh, uh, two questions to our speakers. And I guess both of them were partly covered uh, in, in your speeches, but still I, I would try. The first issue is, and uh, this is Edwin when you finished, uh, believe, do you believe that this international uh, global actions like U U.S. tax reform, the reforms of tax system in Europe, are leading to rather closing the loopholes that have a uh, really bad effect on the tax base uh, uh, and creating the opportunities for profit shifting, or uh, you think that uh, there is not a progress? And the second, both uh, of you speakers, uh, Stephen and Edwin, you touch upon the question of sustainability of the tax system, and I guess both of you have shown that in the U.S. there is a question of sustainability of current setup. That's why the measures are temporary. But at the same time, uh, you know, for example, your slide concerning the CFC taxation in some EU countries is uh, also opening for me the question to which extent in some other countries there is also issue of sustainability of the tax system. So if you can comment um, uh, on both of that, maybe starting with Stephen, and then I ask the uh, pass floor to, uh, to Yepe. Um, <clears throat> so the first question was, are U.S. reforms uh, leading to closing of loopholes? Uh, so l let's put some framework around the question. Um, uh, the concern that has been most vocal uh, and most obvious in terms of uh, in recent years has been profit shifting as opposed to shifting of real investment. So what we've seen evidence of is very substantial profit shifting, often by using techniques to transfer technical legal ownership or even not even that mere ta U.S. tax ownership of intangibles to a particular low tax location to attract profits that can be taxed at a lower level. BEPS has only lightly um, affected that, and guilty does affect that in the, fall, in the respect that when you transfer 
uh, income outside the United States under the new law but not tangible investment, you only get the exemption for a return to tangible investment. The excess over that 10 percent is taxed at 10.5 percent. So compared to prior law, 10.5 percent is more than I was effectively paying if you remember my right-hand column in the low-tax countries, and it was lower than that, it was more than I was effectively paying on shifting income under old U.S. law. So in that respect, guilty is going to increase the cost of profit shifting in a wide range of cases. But I think, as Edwin pointed out, it still is profitable from a U.S. point of view because it's 10.5 percent instead of potentially 21 percent. If it's 10.5% instead of 13.125%, then that's much closer. And what this says is we really, it depends on your business footprint, what I call your business footprint, who your customers are, how you're set up today. Um, so loopholes remain. They will be less valuable. And so it's a partial but incomplete response. Mm -hmm. There is a simple way to make that response much stronger, and this goes to sustainability. So I'll connect these two and then come back for a moment to real investment. The simple way to, re to make the response much stronger, if this is inadequate, is to reduce the size of the deduction and increase the effective tax rate on guilty. So that's not changing the headline rate of 21 percent. It's just changing the amount of the deduction, which, frankly, you probably had never heard of before coming into the room. You won't hear of after leaving the room. It is what we call a not very visible way of increasing an effective tax rate. Now, I don't see that happening in the near term, but it could happen in the future. Um, as to broader sustainability, um, we have enormous revenue pressures in the United States facing us. Um, we don't know the instruments that are going to be used to address those. It could be a value-added tax, but there's a very powerful U.S. sort of dislike of that tax for some reason that I do not fully understand. But maybe as a carbon tax, it is brought in through the back door as a consumption tax. I don't know the answer. I would have thought that politicians tend to want to increase taxes on corporations who don't vote before they do other things that affect people that vote. But I've been wrong about that for many, many years. So I, 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 I just leave it at that. And European sustainability issues? Um, I have less visibility into the European sustainability. Um, uh, the biggest international issue today that is not sustainable is is attempted to be very addressed in a very limited way by the digital tax and by the beat. And, and they aren't really directed at that. And that is host country taxation of remote sellers who sell into the market without physical presence. Um, everything that's been done today so far, the diverted profits tax in the UK and now in Australia, the proposed digital tax, the beat, don't even, don't meaningfully address that problem. Um, that is the most important international tax issue to achieve a consensus on. It's possible to do, um, but it should not be limited to digital. It should attack, it, it should attack, it should tax all remote uh, economic activity that really derives its value from the marketplace, it sells into the marketplace, and that has actually made investments outside in trademarks, in building databases, and everything else that really are economically have their value inside the market. That's our challenge, and that's a longer-term project. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I think I mostly agree with your answer. I think, you know, when you look at the budget window in the U.S. that ends for this U.S. tax reform in 2027, um, the effective marginal corporate tax rate will increase because direct expensing is not possible anymore. It certainly, I think, closes some loopholes. The U.S. makes an end to the incentive of very complex tax planning to obtain a deferral 
of U.S. tax on foreign income. That's at least the result, the main result, I think, of U.S. tax reform. Um, when I look at Europe, I think, eight at one and eight at two close a lot of loopholes. loopholes. I think most importantly, the measures around uh, hybrid mismatches, hybrid mismatch entities, financing, etc. And when you look at the sustainability of the tax system, I think what happened in BEPS and what happened in eight at one and two is just a quick fix uh, for issues in the current system, not more than a quick fix. I was at the OCD when we discussed BEPS and that's how BEPS was intended until until the US and France, with a lot of resistance of the US, added taxation of the digital economy to the actions. And that's about the fundamentals, I think, underlying the international tax system. We're all sort of addicted, it seems, to concepts like residence and source and the arm's length principle. Well, residence doesn't work really good if you can really scale activities in a country without having a physical presence. That's what Steve alluded to. Um, the arm's length principle is very hard to apply if you um, have a fictional digital PE. That's one in the, the proposal of the Commission, the comprehensive solution. You first create a proxy for physical presence, the digital PE, and then you need a solution to allocate profits to something that's not there. So another proxy to the arm's length principle that's already very hard to apply when you look at very complex business models. Uh, large companies with functions and activities all over the world, it's very hard to understand where value is added, how value is added, and who has done it, let alone to price it according to arm's length principle. So I think we really need to open our minds to more solutions, broaden our minds to more well, fundamental solutions to the issues we're facing. And that all has to do, I think, with the sustainability of the current tax system. And that's not limited to, that's not limited to digital companies. We cannot separate the digital, com the digital economy from the rest of the economy. All companies are in the process of digitalizing. Uh, Mercedes is calling its itself a, a transport provider instead of a car producer. Well, that, that means something. That means something for the business models. That means something for uh, the idea we have on value creation. We have to understand those business, business models better, I think, than we do now. We have to understand better how value is created by uh, data provided by consumers um, before we come up with quick fixes and new proxies into the new into the uh, current tax system. Let's stop here. Thank you so much, uh, also to you, Edwin. Um, so now I will take over for the last 10-15 uh, minutes we have left for our session today, um, and I, I wanted also to open up to to the to uh, the audience so you can prepare yourself for a question. I just want to tell one anecdote. I mean. When they adopted the um, Trump tax reform, uh, I was in, in the, in the, at the Capitol Hill with, with some colleagues, and I asked some of the senators at the time whether they had you know, the opportunity to read the whole bill before they kind of voted on it, and they didn't. You know, they voted on something they, they could not understand. Uh, they, they need to have time to, to read all, everything and understand all of the details in it. So also, Steve, when you say it's about you don't understand why, why uh, voters don't react, I think in, in a sense, also sometimes, uh, you know how it is in the U.S., uh, money also play a big role in politics. So maybe uh, some of the things that I saw in the last phase of the tax reform was also heavy lobbying and, and some loopholes that are created. But that's another discussion. But I, I just want to, to react on that. Then, I mean, our final part, we have two, two things here. We have, you know, kind of the how does this um, new tax reform, what is the consequences for the, for the global order that we discuss? Uh, mm -hmm particular Europe-U.S. relations, um, and, uh, and, and, and and that matter, I, I think it was um, also alluded to when it comes to trade. There's, of course, something on, on trade there as well, uh, and the linkage to WTO and so on. That's the one, one part of it. But what, what, I, what I also want to maybe, uh, before we end at least also, to raise the question, um, now we're doing these quick fixes. I think, in a way, also the U.S. tax reform is a quick fix to some of the problems they have. Um, but in the longer run, the solution for corporate taxation is probably something like the CCCTB, you know, moving to a more con uh, consolidated corporate tax system that fits the 21st century. So one of my questions will be, is there, is there any of the things we're doing in Europe and U.S. now that, that can bring us together, more together, and not uh, fragment our approach to corporate taxation? Is there, is, is there a way when we meet our 
counterparts in Congress, uh, that we can talk to them when we meet the um, uh, Treasury, uh, that we can say, okay, we can work together on, on tax, corporate taxation that will, that will end this, I think, abusive uh, tax speculation we see for corporations and, and focus more on, on, your, on competition, on who is the best to do things and not who is the best to plan their taxes. I think that's the question I would like you to, to think about. But I will also open up for, for the audience, so please, I know it's been very technical, but uh, there's a lot of uh, very high-skilled people here, so, so please, we'll take a few questions, and then we'll, you have to round up at, at the end. Okay, thank you, and please introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ralf Brugelmann, Federation of German Industries. I'd like to address my question to both of the experts, because you both described the U.S. tax reform dominantly from the perspective of a U.S. company investing in Europe, most uh, dominantly investing in uh, small member states, but we also, they do exist, European business, European company doing business worldwide, doing business in the US. And from my opinion, and uh, in particular coming from Germany, in my opinion it's very important how to keep our, uh, how to keep the business of our own companies, how to keep the business, worldwide business of our own companies running. And here, in my opinion, the mostly neglected beat is the most crucial issue. As Mr. Erich, who is no longer present, uh, correctly pointed out, uh, the beat denies deductibility for completely normal uh, businesses. You sell parts of a car to your subsidiary in the U.S., and yes, they might be deductible as uh, costs for goods sold. But another example is, for example, a logistic company. They ship a good from Brussels to Boston, and um, contradictory to what Mr. Erich said, there is no cost for goods sold for logistics because, and in consequence, the whole amount charged for the U.S. customer is taxed in the U.S. You ship from Brussels to Boston, it enters in New York, and normally the profit uh, corresponding to the U.S. is from shipping from New York to Boston. And the rest is done by the European carrier. Yeah. But now the costs for the European carrier are no longer deductible, to my understanding. Is that right? I think so, yes. And uh, how do we keep that running, the business, and how should European companies react best? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else would like to pose a question? If not, I will just... Uh let first, I think, Stephen uh, answer, and then... Um, I do plead guilty to having, pardon the use of the term, to having uh, a focused uh, primarily on the effects on U.S. companies that has been my primary focus so far. Um, I think that the, the, um, there are many problems with the beat. I think we should talk separately about the specifics of the shipping issue that you described, it is it, it hits most adversely the innocent service provider companies. I do think that the companies that are global that provide services where there's a related party service uh, sold to the U.S. group that that is um, brought into the net whether or not it's abusive. I think there's no question. So. So this is a provision that was designed to be objective and application and um, so goes beyond the purely anti-abuse aspect. Um, the question, the, the, there's a flip answer to the question, meaning a, a too easy answer, but it is in fact true that this bill attempted to raise some of its money to pay for the lower tax rate from foreign owned groups. No question about that. The beat, a higher uh, limitation on interest expense or potentially more effective limitation on interest expense. Um, if the beat issues were taken care of, were ameliorated and made more rational, then I still think there are some advantages in relative terms for a foreign company operating in the United States and relative to a U.S. company, but they have been shrunk. And coming back to the earlier question, as I said before, the advantage of profit shifting has been shrunk. 
So not to minimize the very substantial continuing problems, the fact is we are in a world now where the differences are closer than they were before, which normally means there's better opportunity for conversation about solutions. I'll stop there and give Edwin a chance to reply. Yeah, Edwin, from a European company perspective, this is really damaging competition uh, a lot. When we talk to clients at this moment, U.S. tax reform is a concern, but that's still a lot unclear because the IRS has still to issue regulations. Um, there's unclarity, for example, around FIDI. If you move your R&D to the U.S., there's no answer to the question, how can I get my intangibles out of the U.S. if I want to do that in the future? That's what I call the Hotel California phenomenon. You can check in, but never check out. Um, Brexit is of a more imminent concern at the moment for most of our clients, I think. Um, looking at your broader question, Jeppe, uh, when you're saying, well, should we look broader to carbon taxes, to sales taxes? I think a system where we don't have a certain taxation on corporates is perceived as inequitable in at least the European Union. So there has to be a form of taxation uh, of corporates, I think, uh, where it's not obvious that the economic incidence will go to the consumers. So, but we have to broaden, I think, our scope and to be more open-minded in discussing uh, pros and cons, you know, of destination-based systems, of uh, cash flow-based systems instead of profit-based systems. We have to be more open to different systems, I think, in of allocating profits to the various parts of a multinational, not concluding that we should move to formula apportionment. There are a lot of flaws in that as well, you know. But more open-minded, really charting, I think, and mapping all pros and cons of the various systems and the various options we have to make sure that our corporate tax system, I don't say corporate income tax because it can also be cash flow, that the corporate tax system is really fit for the future and, and sustainable. Edwin, um, any, yeah, there's, uh, I think, on the back there, you, yes, please. Um, I'm not sure if I need to use the microphone. Yeah. Um, you, you, you've got a pink, so please. Great, sorry, found it. Um, I'm Louise Heenan, I'm the Irish tax attaché in the council, so thanks to all the speakers, it's been a very interesting discussion. Um, just one question, um, I suppose if we look at the last number of years, it's been a turbulent time in international tax policy. We've seen more agreement at international level than we've seen previously in terms of the BEPS uh, agreements and the implementation of the BEPS agreements, uh, both in the US and in the EU. And that implementation is still very much live. Uh, and my question is, I suppose, to what extent do you think in either the US regulations implementing US tax reform or in EU's implementation of international agreements, do you think there's still scope um, to have these conversations, to discuss the beat and how it could be implemented? Um, and then I suppose my second question would be in terms of taking that multilateralism forward. I think the chair spoke very well about needing to have conversations between the EU and the US. Um, and do you think that there is scope for further multilateral agreements in coming years, given that we've got pretty fundamental questions to find answers to? Thank you. Two big questions. I'll take the final question and then I will let the panel answer. Uh, I think it was you on the far left. Thank you. Yes, a very interesting question. I'm a policy advisor with the ECR. Um, um, particularly, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Shea, you raised the issue of um, uh, related to uh, fiscal devalu devaluation as the U.S. seems to, be in to have had interest in uh, attempting a fiscal devaluation, devil sorry, which is contradictory to the WTO rules in uh, um, raising uh, export subsidies and imposing taxes on imports or tariffs, uh, implicit or if, if not, uh, or indirect, if not uh, explicit. But this was a discussion, I, I understood, and, and then it was, uh, um, they, they gave this up, these plans, because of the contradiction, and instead uh, uh, resulted in these other measures, which are less contradictory. Could you more enlighten me on, on that discussion and, and why the U.S. just doesn't simply uh, use exchange rate policy to raise exports and reduce imports since it's uh, 
they have all the measures available to them. Good. Thank you so much. And then we'll take the final round in the panel. I think, Stephen, you're, you're first. Uh, there was several questions. Wow. <laughs> um, those are great questions. So let me start with this, the last one. Um, the, our colleague who spoke before um, correctly noted that there had been objection to the destination-based cash flow tax on trade grounds. The reason for that was it was designed without a deduction for wages, and that is arguably inconsistent with um, the way the trade rules are set up. Um, that is not why it was withdrawn in the United States. It was withdrawn in the United States because the business community does not believe the economic theory that um, a well-designed destination-based tax will um, not distort trade because currency adjustments will um, balance out the differences. Um, I think the bigger problem is not just the business community doesn't believe it. That's probably overstating it. They didn't believe the adjustments would be in time, and they don't think they knew how to work with them. They just were afraid that it was really going to hit um, uh, importers. And so some major businesses who affect some, a number of senators were able to stop it. U.S. tax reform is explain, explainable entirely in terms of domestic politics, as is true of tax reforms of most countries. So the fact that things happen that may have aligned with an objection from the EU, I don't think it's accurate to say that's why it was changed. There may be other cases where it would be, but that wasn't it. Um, and uh, so that, that's one set of questions. And that is, in a way explains why we shifted to an FDII without a blink of an eye, which is more obviously inconsistent with the WTO than the cash flow tax was. So that's, I think, responsive to your question. Um, with respect to multilateralism, um, the, 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 we are, uh, the United States, but also countries representing in this room, are in the midst of some of the most severe nationalist um, movements or, or directions that I've seen in my lifetime. Um, in the United States, I have a high degree of confidence that that is going to ameliorate um, after Mr. Trump's first term or even within his first term if he gets beaten up, as I think he will be in the midterm elections, although I've been wrong about elections before. There, it, is, it is simply essential. It is essential for the United States to be at the table as we resolve how to tax remote sellers. It, it is a major issue. It's not limited to digital. We're just talking about digital today because we haven't put our minds together about how to reach more broadly. Host or source country, because so much of the world, including the United States, on a very limited basis, has moved to exempt uh, taxation of foreign subsidiary income. The U.S. is more limited than anyone else. But notwithstanding that, if the resident country that owns the capital isn't going to tax the income returned to the capital, then source countries are going to want to or need to. And in the case of digital, it's a question of fairness, not just digital. In the case of remote sellers, it's a question of fairness to the businesses that are operating within the country. If the U.S. is not at the table um, in those discussions in a significant and meaningful way, then we are idiots. Um, so I have to believe we're going to be um, uh, engaged in molding at multilateral discussions of that, those issues. And I think more broadly, after we get over our current craze with um, uh, Make America Great and, and Live Without the Rest of the World, because it's not sustainable. Thank you, Stephen. And then Edwin, please. Yeah, what can one say after that? Um, what, I, what I'm more concerned of, you know, uh, than the discussion right now on tariffs and uh, tariffs in the EU to retaliate, U.S. introduction of tariffs is uh, the sort of end of multilateralism that, that I see. That's the question you asked. Um, there was a high, high spirit, I think, of multilateralism in the BEPS project. All countries unified in the fight against base erosion and profit shifting. What you see now around digital tax and 
digital tax is nothing else than discussion on the fundamentals underlying the international tax system, is that you see the EU moving in one direction, the UN is discussing digital, well, discussing the principles, I think, uh, the US is sticking to residence and the arm's length principle, while well, I think, you know, in, in order to make it very prosperous and, and driving business opportunities and not hampering business, it's very important to have multilateral solutions and point of views. Um, if we all have our own system in taxing companies, this will lead to multiple taxation, to unresolvable disputes, uh, and that will really hamper, I think, economic uh, prosperity in the end of the day. So I'm more concerned about unilateralism than I'm concerned at this moment on the discussion on, on tariffs on motorcycles and cars. Thank you so much, Edwin. And uh, with these uh, last words, it's, we have to wrap up now our session for today. On my behalf, uh, for, for my part, I will say uh, thank you for, for giving some light on this very complicated issue on, on the U.S. tax reform and the consequences for our global economic order, Europe in particular, trade issues, uh, cooperation around uh, corporate taxation, uh, loopholes, new loopholes, or um, existing loopholes closed. All of that uh, we need to, to, to further discuss. I can tell for, for, for our part, um, our committee, Tax 3, will visit the U.S. Uh, next month. So we'll go and talk to our American counterparts in, in Congress and Treasury and other places uh, about how to, to close loopholes and fight uh, uh, unfair tax practices and, and so on. Um, and it is going to be very interesting. But I think with this, with, with both Steve and Edwin uh, and also Mr. Ehring, we had a very good discussion today. I, I don't want to uh, continue more, just to say that I think this discussion just started. We, we need to continue, and uh, we need to evaluate all details, and we also need to find ways of cooperating between uh, European Union and the U.S. Uh, through our organizations, OECD, but also bilaterally. I think it's important that we have much more contact to solve some of the issues we discussed here. So thank you, and I will leave the floor now to Ludek to conclude. Thank you very much, Jeppe. Just uh, three points. The first, I guess, it was extremely rich on information but also on some hopes that I must say that a lot of outcomes sounds more positive to me than I would expect. The, the second, what I really wish, that the governments work more on making the taxes stable, predictable, and easy to comply. And this would allow actually businesses to less invest into tax strategies, tax compliance, and more invest, invest in innovation, R&D, and copy, competing at the market. And this is what would be the, the, the result that I guess we should be aiming for. But we are not there yet. We are making progress. We are making effort. So we can't do more now. And uh, let me just thank all our guests that make this event, uh, I guess, so interesting. Let me thank all of you. I know how uh, Wednesday afternoon can be busy. So I'm really uh, impressed that uh, so many people have turned out and so many stayed until after the end. And not le uh, last not least, uh, thank all who helped us to organize the event, notably Petra. So uh, this is not end of our tax debates. Uh, we will see each other at tax, e tax committee or other events. Thank, thanks a lot and have a nice afternoon.